from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell in London where... Yes, sport is starting to return slowly but surely and even our socialising is starting to pick up and we're even allowed to have bubbles now. That's the new terminology. But welcome to our very own Stumped Bubble here. It's great to, to see you all with me. Hi, it's Jim Maxwell in Sydney and life is really starting to kick on here. They're playing rugby league. Rugby union's not far away and I'm at that stage of life where a birthday party keeps your spirits up. So I was at a friend's 70th yesterday. There were eight of us. Yes, glorious social isolation. Eight people around a table with rain tumbling down outside. But, um, yeah, we blew a few candles out and, and had some fun, as you do if you have a lunch party that finishes um, when it's dark. So I hope you're having fun wherever you are and the Charo is hitting a golf ball or, or swatting um, a tennis ball. Yeah, except on Thursdays because of the, this lovely program that we're involved with. Yeah, hi, I'm Charu Sharma for All India Radio in Bangalore once again, where we're awaiting the monsoon, which traditionally arrives around the well early part of June and stays till virtually the end of September. So that's about a three-month period where a lot of outdoor sports, uh, such as cricket, which are hampered because of a little bit of rain, are traditionally not held. Well, this week, we're in fact going to focus on racial equality in cricket. Uh, the West Indies men have just arrived in England, incidentally, ahead of their three test series due to start on the 8th of July, by a secure venue with no spectators. But the team have arrived here against a backdrop of anti-racism protests, with thousands having taken to the streets in response to the killing of the black American George Floyd in police custody in Minneapolis. Now, the Black Lives Matter movement is really shining a light on racial inequalities in all walks of life, all over the world and so we want to explore the state of play when it comes to cricket. Our first guest is or very familiar to Stumped listeners. She is Director of Women's Cricket at Surrey, a World Cup winner in 2009 and she was the first black woman to play for England. Ebony Rainford Brent, how are you? Hi guys, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And, uh, it's, it's a crazy time in the world though right now, right? It is. A disclaimer, Ebony and I are pretty good friends so we've had some conversations over the last uh, week or so but just tell us and Jim Char and our listeners how George Floyd's death and the aftermath has affected you. Yeah, I've been um, pretty emotionally rocked, if I'm honest. I I remember the morning waking up and on your social media, I watched uh, the short version of the video at first and burst into tears immediately. I, you know, I've known for a long time the issues in the US around pre police brutality. And I've seen a number of videos. It's just off the back of Ahmad Arbery, who'd been shot uh, whilst just going for a jog. Um, I see videos of young kids uh, being punched in the face by police. Um, and also here, I know the disparity. A lot of my friends growing up have been stopped and searched and there's been pre police brutality. So it hit me very hard. Um, I was in floods of tears uh, for about two days consistently. I've been out protesting. Um, you know, I know it's one of those ones where you sort of weigh up, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And some would say, would that, is that responsible? And I guess racism for me is a pandemic and a virus that's been around for 400 years. Um, you know, the amount of black plate people have been killed through Atlantic slave trade, the amount of people disproportionately uh, killed through the police system, um, how it affects our you know, livelihood and, and um, communities, which have been ravaged for a number of years. I was just so moved. We'll come to cricket specifically in a moment, but you know, broad question society-wise, what do you hope that this period and the, the demonstrations, not least, will achieve? Yeah, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because I think, you know, the, the, the number one thing is kind of building awareness, which is, you know, a, a number of us aren't aware how, how uh, the, the society is broken down and that a number of people are... Uh, so in a simple example, CVs, uh, two identical CVs, gets tested all the time, go into a job, and if it has a name that sounds black or brown, um, you know, something like five or six times less likely to be looked at. So jobs are affected um, to all these sort of things. Once you start building awareness and companies start to realize how much bias plays into the decisions of our society. So I think number one is awareness. Then, two, it needs to be really woven into the process. I think a period of reflection. Um, you know, let's be honest, there's going to be a number of people who don't agree with this. Um, maybe the All Lives Matter crew who are sort of saying, what about us or what about everybody? That's not so much the issue. This is not about saying other communities don't matter. It's about 
recognizing that one specific community consistently over history have been oppressed in a number of ways that plays out through whether it's police violence or lower. So awareness, number one, and I think that in itself is a number of years. You know, I know a lot of people are starting to educate, read themselves, watch documentaries and start to understand. I think that starts the spiral. And the final thing I'll say on this, if you watch a video of George Floyd and you feel uncomfortable about that, that's a good sign. I think it will help us make action. If you feel uncomfortable that in our country um, there are no black players coming through our system, if you feel emotive about that, then we'll do something. So for me, it's about connecting um, and making a difference. So on cricket, Ebs, mm. tell us your story of how you first got into the sport, because you know, growing up as you did, a young black girl in London, cricket was predominantly, well, as it is now, predominantly white. I grew up, like you say, South London, uh, sort of Hernhill, Brixton way, and um, cricket was not in our consciousness at all. Uh, we, I remember loving football, because that's what, you know, lots of different communities played. And it was someone coming into my primary school when I was 10 years old. He was actually a Jamaican guy. Um, who was doing a sort of charity initiative to try and introduce cricket into state schools. Um, started playing street cricket with a very diverse group, black, white, Asian, Greeks, you know, the works, um, like out in Stockwell Park. So very rough games we were playing. And then there was one lady, this woman has changed my life. She's passed away now, but her name's Jenny Washtrak. She talent spotted me. We were playing like a little um, competition. They needed a girl. So I went down as the one girl. And she talent spotted me when she was connected to a lot of the community initiatives and the Surrey pathway. So it was her that brought me in. She realized, you know, financially it was quite tricky. My mum, a single parent of four kids, um, didn't have a car. So she used to drive me everywhere. And what were your experiences then once you were in cricket? I think from a young kid, it was interesting. So Bearing in mind, I came from a diverse community where race was never an issue. As soon as I went into the cricket world, uh, just people had lack of understanding because they didn't know any black people. So it was colours of uh, questions. Do you wash your skin? Um, uh, you know, people would just start putting their hands in your hair. They tell you your food smells. Um, you know, I remember I have a very long name, as you know, Ali. And people <laughs> say, oh, God, where you're from. I bet your mum doesn't know who your dad is. That's why you've got so many names. So all mm. these sort of things started to filter into my experience as a kid. You know, all those sort of things would happen. And I, if I'm honest, I don't think they were said maliciously, but they were ridiculously ignorant and they didn't understand. And that was great at me. I didn't say anything because you're the only one. And then later on in my career, um, you know, co comments from coaches, things like I remember Obama when he got elected as president, um, the paper was slammed down in front of me and sort of said, I bet you're a lot are happy, meaning obviously not, you're a lot being black. Uh, I've been told... Um, once when I was asking a question about selection, uh, we're not going to select you for this game because they don't like your sort up here. Um, so, look, I'm, you know, I can tell you story after story mm. after story, which I'm embarrassed myself that I never took it on, but I never felt I'd be supportive if I did speak up. Well, that's um, an issue in itself, isn't it? And, and that would go yeah. for, for players as well. Stay with us, Ebony, because I want to talk about another specific story um, that's come to light this week in relation to race. So Darren Sammy, the, the former West Indies captain, took to social media to express his anger when he found out that his nickname in the Indian Premier League referred to the colour of his skin. Now, Sammy was part of the Sunrisers Hyderabad dressing room in the IPL in 2013 and 2014, and he asked his former teammates if they could explain themselves. Instantly, I remember when I played for Sunrisers Hyderabad in 2013 and 2014, I was being called the exact same word that he described that was degrading to us black people. So I, won, I instantly got very angry about it, knowing now what that word meant. I will be messaging those people, you guys know, who you are and I must admit at the time in which I was being called that I actually did not know what it meant I thought it meant strong stallion or whatever it is and I saw no problems with it because I was ignorant to the fact that I did not know what it meant I assumed it meant something else that was uplifting but every time I was called it, it was me and, and Tisara Pereira, 
there was always laughter in the in the moment. So me being a team man, I thought teammates are happy. It must be something funny. But you could understand my frustration and my anger when it was pointed out to me that it wasn't funny at all. It was degrading. Not about you, I found that a really powerful video. He was talking directly to the camera. He was very calm, very composed, but you could see the hurt in his eyes. Charu, let me come to you first on this one, because that word that Sammy uh, was referring to has been widely reported as Kalu. And indeed, one of the Indian papers dug out a photograph that was posted by Ishant Sharma that labelled Sammy with that when he was his teammate at Sunrisers. So what does it mean? Is it a racist term? Oh, Alison, well, you know, now we're opening up a bit of a, a long discussion here once again, the possibility of. But let me try and offer uh, Darren Sammy a bit of a balm here by suggesting uh, and, and by confessing that even I, from a very early age, uh, coming from the north of India and being a lot darker than the average North Indian, have been called Kalu all the time. Uh, and What's his literal all I can meaning? Say, exactly. So all I can say is that it has always in India been taken as a literal terminology of being dark, Kalu as in Kala as in dark, and has little or no derogatory reference ever. Uh, now, people from the north, India, north of India are generally a lot lighter. And, and, and this is the situation in a multi-skinned or multicultural society. Uh, and, and I, you know, so I'm no expert here. But I would like to suggest that people from the south of India, closer to the equator, uh, hotter climes, uh, have been generally of darker skin. And there has been a lot of color references. But never has it been suggested that just because people were darker, they achieved less. There have been all manners of high achievers in just about every field from the south of India. So the term really is, is very literal in our part of the world. Now, I realize that it has derogatory con uh, connotations elsewhere, but, you know, it's, it's a sort of a cultural thing then uh, here. And I would like to suggest to Darren that it's just a color reference. It is not a derogatory term in general. Well, we'll pick up on that, but let's hear again from uh, Darren Sammy, because since he released that Instagram video, he has spoken to teammates and he had this then to say to our colleagues at the BBC Asian Network. I am in no way, shape or form trying to call or pinpoint anybody. The fact that I understand that that word that I've been called can be described as a degrading, condescending type of word. I'm saying, whether you say it out of, said it out of love at that time, it's a word that shouldn't be used because it could be described as offensive to people of color. And I think that's my biggest takeaway from that, educating people. You know, I still have enough love for these guys. And uh, you mentioned uh, Ishan Sharma. Ishan Sharma has a poster of me and him from Champions Trophy, uh, my hand over his shoulder, and I have signed it, and I have said, brothers for life. That's the relationship. So yes, the conversation to expose it or, or talk about it, it was a difficult one, but it is one that is needed. If you looked at Sammy's original Instagram video, Cherry, there was so many, hundreds and hundreds of comments beneath it, many from Indian cricket fans who had varying views even within the country. One Indian fan, for example, saying, well, when it comes to other people like you calling you that, you don't mind it. But when it comes from a stranger or someone who isn't like you, that's when it feels degrading. So there are so many layers of, of nuance around it. Well, yeah, there are all sorts of subtleties. Like I said, this is opening up a very, very large discussion. But I, I would like to suggest once again that, you know, it may seem derogatory, but it's not. It's just a term of sometimes even endearment. You know, I have lots of friends who are called Kalu, and I still call them Kalu, and, and they're happy to be called Kalu. In fact, one of my other schoolmates, his younger brother is not quite as dark, but he's called Chota Kalu, as in small Kalu. So I do realize that there are many other different cultures in the world. And if there's a certain culture, which is primarily white, if any reference to darker colors is openly derogatory, then we have to deal with it. And even in India, I'm, I'm not, like I said, uh, uh, you, know, you know, condoning uh, the usage of the word at all. And perhaps with more education, and, and that's certainly happening now, the references are reducing. Jim, does it surprise you that actually with the uh, number of international 
dressing rooms that there are these days that cricket it does seem a little bit slow to be, I suppose, learning about each other's culture. Well, that's where the um, IPL has been so important to the game, I think. It's diffused a, a lot of these tensions and perhaps words that are inappropriate that weren't seen as such by those that use them amongst their teammates but realised that, it, as Darren Sammy said, it's, it's probably offensive depending on on uh, where you come from. So um, there's sort of globalisation of uh, cricket through T20 to a large extent in recent times has been important to the education and understanding of people and the way they, they should behave. Yeah, Alison, I'd just like to add a little bit about the IPL that, that, that Jim mentioned. And there's no doubt in my mind that because of the friendships forged uh, in the IPL, different nationalities and different teams, there's a huge level of uh, improvement in the understanding. And the contests between countries now are no longer colored by culture or any kind of economics or anything else. They become much more cricketing contests. And there's no other angst or far less angst involved about competing with other nations only because there's been so much more understanding about uh, how other people behave and live and, and talk and, and, and just a deeper understanding of the subtleties involved. I think the world of cricket can certainly contribute by being uh, leaders in ensuring that, that such obvious references are, are looked down upon and eradicated uh, by just educating everybody else they're in touch with. Mm. Let's hope that cricket can do its part in moving this world forward. Well, that's it for this week's Stumped here on All India Radio. Remember, you can have your say on any of the topics we discuss here on the programme. We're at BBC WS Sport using the hashtag BBC Stumped. So my thanks to Chari Sharma, Jim Maxwell and all of our guests and to you for listening. Make sure you join us again next time. Bye-bye. Stumped is a BBC Sport production for the BBC World Service in association with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and All India Radio.